Guadalajara, set to on the view. I, I don't think the Russians, I think they're, they're bad fellows very often, most of the time. But I do think they are responsible people. And when they said that they think this is the way to proceed and that they will use their influence, I think that is rather a serious statement. But they're also a big power and uh, they don't make statements off their hands. Well, uh, they did twice before. Yeah, but I don't think at that time, Mr. President, I don't think at that time they were in the position to deliver that they're in now. I think they have more, they do have more influence now in, as a result of what's happened in the communist world and as a result of what's happened in China. Well, I asked him when we talked to him. Uh, well, he told me that he thought he had some influence with the North, and the thing that gave them the most distress <coughs> was that we had all these big bases out there, and that uh, while uh, the, 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 that he didn't necessarily underwrite this, but there's a lot of feeling in the rest of the world that people didn't go out and spend billions to build bases to abandon them, and that uh, uh, he thought that if uh, if uh, we could give any, if we could state it some way it hadn't been stated, that we didn't plan to stay there, uh, that uh, uh, stop our bombing, that uh, that uh, might be some uh, uh, movement. And so I said, well, we'll uh, we'll see if we can find some way to assure you. I I can assure you that we won't come home quicker than anybody wants us to come, and uh, that. Uh, while we're not going to turn our face to that part of the world, we are willing to convert, as I said in Baltimore, our investment to the cause of peace and let the United Nations or let the ICC or let the governments themselves uh, turn these things into textile plants and into uh, schools and hospitals and uh, use these buildings for educational centers or anything else and we'll come home and we'll be out of there just as soon as you can have anybody that will guarantee stability. If you let the United Nations have an election, we'll take the winner of the election. If you let the ICC supervise it, we'll take the winner of the election. All we ask is that, uh, is that the people uh, have the right of uh, self-determination and if they want to go your way, all right. If they want to go our way, all right. If they want to go another way, all right. But we just don't believe you ought to sit there and let them heat up babies or just because they're stronger. And so I went to uh, Manila then, and there wasn't a single man that wanted to go as far as I went. Well, you did the right thing. But I said to Gomico at Manila, and that was the purpose of it, that uh, if we can have a ceasefire, and if we can bring all violence to an end, we will be out of there and not to exceed six months. That's the time to get the wives and the kids out of school and pick up them all up and move them out, lock, stock, and barrel. And they said, well, Key wouldn't stand for that. Bill Bundy and them said that, that that just wouldn't work, that that would overthrow Key. So we got Key in, and I said, uh, who knows the most about Vietnam, you or our people? He said, he did. I said, well, you you tell us that you want us to stay there, ad infinitum. He said, no, what's wrong with this? He said, nothing. I'll go with you on that. We just, as soon as we can stand by ourselves and let our own people select what we do, and nobody's going to shoot us while we're willing to you go home. So we said that. But we didn't get one movement. Uh, we haven't got one response. Now, we have, we have for periods, as you have observed, uh, for a good many, for a good deal of the period, we didn't do any bombing. We held back. We didn't get close to any of them. And uh, they didn't move. Then when the weather cleared up, and we hit some targets, railroad yards, and truck concentration center. They tried to shoot at us. 
we don't know really what happened. I don't think these boys, uh, I don't think they really know. I, my pilot, when he sees a, a rain cloud or hail storm or something, he thinks it's 10 miles and it may be 20. And uh, they're being shot at. They're being shot at, and they, they see things they don't see, and I don't know, but my judgment is that they, they, they just, the Sams are just shooting like hell, and this stuff all goes up, it's got to come down. And uh, I think there's no question with what we killed, some civilian, nobody's ever said we didn't. I think that's the biggest fraud that I ever saw, and I think you ought to answer that with Harrison Salisbury. I think you ought to say that uh, we have, uh, that's one of the reasons we want a ceasefire, that's one of the reasons we want a violent stop, that's one of the reasons we said we'd get out in six months, is because we don't like to see civilians killed, and we know that when you hit a target, somebody's going to get killed. And if they... It's just one man that's running the alarm system. When we hit the POL, he gets killed. But if they have thousands that live in the area, well, a lot of them are going to get hurt. But if they don't get hurt, they just go to shooting at each other and they get hurt. And when they shoot at a plane that's right over Hanoi, that bullet goes up a few thousand feet, but it's got to come down. And when it falls, it's going to hurt somebody. And it, uh, it may have a United States flag on it or a Noah flag. And our boys tell us that they didn't bomb any civilian centers. But uh, I'm not prepared to indict them and jail them and charge them with violating my order on the basis of the evidence I have. But I am prepared to say that their orders and their authority extends only to military targets at this time. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's the proper thing. They cannot be condemned. The poor fellows are up there, and they're being tremendous concentration of anti-aircraft. Uh, I would know what I would be doing if I were there. Well, I don't think a single one of them, even when they're getting shot at, dropped a bomb on the city of Hanoi. And I don't believe they missed their targets from what they say, but I do believe that when a mate takes after them, sometimes they jump their stuff, or when a Sam shoots at them, it falls and hits, and it doesn't make any difference. Uh, they don't go out and see whether it's made in Hanoi or in Moscow or Washington or Chicago. They just know they're dead, and they don't know where it came from. President, are you planning when uh, Tommy goes over there to attend any uh, private communications to the fellows on the other side? Yeah, I sent him one. You have? Yeah. Well, that's a good idea. I told him to deal with three big problems. The first one was disarmament. We ought to find some way where these two great nations just quit spending everything in the world in this field. And Khrushchev and I had cut, started cutting down on atomic reactors and on defense expenditures and had everything going in the direction. We were just agreeing with each other every week or so, writing letters. And then all at once they threw them out right before my campaign. And they got scared to go water's wild statement. And I just think that it's foolish for them to build a $50, $100 billion dollar, uh, anti-missile missile and us do the same thing and just get in a big race. And, I'm cutting down on my atomic reactors now, and I'd like to cut down on my defense, as I said in Baltimore, convert it all to peace, and if we could just find some answer, we'd do it. And then I'd talk about the uh, population problems of the world and how the industrialized nations are producing full-fifths of everything produced, and we've got to do something. We have great responsibilities there. And then I get to the food problem and say that we're adding 7,500 million people every year, and so they got to be fed, and we cannot, as uh, leaders, we've got to find peace in order to do these other three things, and we just cannot uh, avoid our responsibilities as giants of the 20th century. I don't use that language, but that's the thought, and that I want him to know that I welcome him every way I can. I don't want anything to be said about it, of course, but uh, I told Tommy that I don't expect it to see any of them will come, but I'd like for anybody that they want to come any time, and any of their second, third men uh, come around and visit with us, and we'll have an open arms. We'll see them, and we're going to keep our powder dry, but always keep our hand out, and 
We want to encourage trade. That's what I'm working on with the Congress. I think you're going to have to work on it a whole lot more. I think you're going to have to do more up on the Congress than you've ever done before, particularly on some of these uh, things that involve a world uh, outlook. I, I rather hope that you... Huh? Say anything about Vietnam? No, no. Not to... I think Tommy thinks that he can get into that, but if we go to broaching it, they back their ears and think that uh, they'll be charged with being our stooges. Well, I think maybe, maybe a private communication from you through him might draw a different reaction. Uh, I, I get the impression up in New York that they're awfully anxious uh, to get the thing proposed and that they have no, they have no damn interest in what happens in the South. They give me that message in 42 different ways. But, uh, they don't do much about it. I don't think they want to tell us that, but they don't do much about it. And I don't think it, uh, I just think it in no way is not ready. It, uh, everybody, everybody thinks in no way is ready. The Pope, the Poles, the Russian. But when you really get down to it, they just cannot make a budge there with this situation as it is. And well, I, I don't disagree with that assessment. But uh, I, uh, I, I say to him, uh, well, here's what we've done. We draw a line around the line. We say we won't go in this line. We keep it there for months. Then we go in there and where they're sending all these trucks, and where they got all these railroad yards and doing all this shit and so forth. And, they're five or six miles outside of town, but uh, they're right in Saigon blowing up the port, right inside. And uh, they've killed more civilians uh, purposely than uh, uh, about ten times what we've killed accidentally. And uh, uh, so I say, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. You will not see a plane fly over a and you won't see a plane fly over Haiphong, and we've got a circle here, and we won't do anything. Now, you give me some reciprocate action. And by God, they just shoot down one of my patrols immediately. They don't do one damn thing, and they don't acknowledge it, and you can't hear from them. You ask the Russians why they can't deliver something, they say, well, they're not quite ready yet. Well, I, I, uh... I haven't been over in long in days. And I haven't been over Haiphong in weeks. And I'm just sitting here urging them. But I've got all the weight of the world saying, for God's sake, quit letting these, uh, these trucks assemble there and come down here and just kill our people. Yeah. I, I, I think I'm going to be trying, not by Bertram Russell, yeah. but by Ms. Goldberg for killing her boy without uh, giving him uh, the, the weapons to protect himself. Well, he's, he's becoming Huh? Russell has become a nut. No, but you get my point there. I think my great danger is how can a commander in chief stop his men from fighting unless the other side is just willing to do something? Yeah. Well, that is what the. Uh, That's the point you made in the beginning all violence, all ceasefire. That war has got to come to an end. The total war has got to come to an end. That's what we'll say again today. But the uh, thought that was in the back of my mind. But to, uh, I, I, I agree with the assessment that they're not ready in the north. I agree with that. But I believe I would keep putting it up to the right, a private tail, that uh, as far as you're concerned, you're ready to do business. Now it's up to them to produce the situation where business could be done on both sides. Now, I don't think they would resist that. But this year, I discovered when Benito was here, and then when Kuznetsov came later, and he, I think, is the writer of the two fellows, Kuznetsov. He's the deputy board minister. I, uh, I got the impression that uh, they are coming closer to where their influence can have some effect. The more they feel they've got support in these other communist parties, the more they are worried about China. They are plenty worried about them. The more they are, uh, they may be ready. Now, they're not going to be ready openly because of propaganda reasons. They've got to make speeches, attack us. But uh, there seems to be more and more, from the conversations I've had, a disposition to, to move into 
someone. But well, my thought would be some some appropriate time that uh, you try and initiate a private conversation with their leaders on this stuff. Uh, they're not uh, unrealistic, and uh, they know damn well that you're just not going to put your tail between your legs and run home. Uh, they're pretty, uh, they're pretty realistic, you know, and they don't take, I think, too much to heart. Well, why don't you talk to them and tell them you can deliver, tell the United Nations, man. I said, why don't you tell the United Nations man that you can deliver your man, that you're ready to do business any time he can pay a drop. He's a kind of a minor character, that's the trouble. Uh, well, that gets home, though. He's high up in the, in the hierarchy, you know. Mr. President, let me ask you this. Are you preparing a reply to 